playing from Seoul. We are going to be spending most of the day trying to see some of the more historical landmarks around the city, but we definitely wanted to start the day off right. We initially went to an espresso bar, which was absolutely delicious, but unfortunately a coffee that small just cannot sustain us throughout the day, so we've decided to go a little bit more local. So apparently the coffee culture here is huge and Koreans are massive fans of iced Americanos in gigantic quantities. So we have come to a local chain called Mega Coffee and we have got a 32 ounce, yes 32 ounce, iced Americano. All right, let's start the day. Good morning from me too. Yes, I'm also here. And welcome to Youngbuk Gung Palace. Who knows how you're actually supposed to pronounce it? The ticket is 3,000 won each and that works out to about three Canadian dollars each. into this outer courtyard of the palace we were approached by these two lovely ladies who are from you said a university yeah we're from Yeko. and they're volunteering and they said oh we're offering free tours so we've decided to take them up on one and so far they told us that the palace is comprised of two parts the outer palace and inner palace and that there are five main palaces here in Seoul and this one is the largest and the oldest. So we're gonna go explore with them. How lucky are we? go into the throne room which is just behind me. A little bit of added context to this, apparently this whole complex was built in 1395 so this is upwards of 600 years old which is crazy to think about and it was all in kind of the height of Korea's powers during the Joseon dynasty. This is not only a royal residence, but it was also the seat of government during the Joseon dynasty. It's interesting though, because actually, in spite of the fact that this palace is obviously now disused, this whole area is still an administrative center for the Korean government. Another interesting part about this palace is that there are certain parts that seem to be very old and quite dated, whereas a lot of other parts seem to be quite new looking. And the reason for that is because through the various struggles for power in Korea, including numerous attempts to at take over by the Japanese, then parts of this palace were systematically destroyed and then rebuilt in their original glory. So as a result, it seems like a little bit of a patchwork, but it still blends together to look as incredible as you can see on camera.
more private office that we're now in front of. And behind the throne, there is actually this painting, and it's quite representative. The red sun represents the king, the white moon represents the queen, the five peaks represent the Chosun land, the trees represent the officials, and then the water represents the people. So what we've seen up to now is referred to as the outer palace. We are now in the inner palace and what is behind me is actually the king's apartment. So this would be where he would come to rest after a long day of ruling over his kingdom. see behind me the middle is kind of empty and we've just been told that there's never much furniture because the kings were always afraid of assassination and so if you had like a closet someone could be hiding in there and then the smaller furniture could be used as a weapon and so that's why there's nothing really in here and then on the sides apparently there's rooms in the form of like hashtags so then there would be nine rooms and the king would sleep in the middle room So it's a little bit more feminine and we've been told that that is represented by some of like the orange bricks that you see around here and in the Queen's Palace behind me it is the same layout as with the King's Palace so the hashtag formation on either side of the main space in the middle. about the heating. As you can see, there's these holes here. So the heating worked from the ground up. There was fires lit underneath and it heated the stone floors. And as most people know, heat rises and that's how it evenly heated the buildings. And then right over here, there's these beautiful chimneys and that's how the smoke escaped. I just think it's so nice that something that's functional is also beautiful and that's definitely reminiscent of Gaudi's architecture, although that was what, like 600 years later after this was built. about meeting these girls and getting this free tour is that we've learned so many interesting facts and one of them is about the color green I was really curious because in a lot of Asian countries most of the palaces are like red and gold whereas this green color is just so predominant here and we were told it's one of the royal colors and that actually the reason that green was used so much is because it's cheaper than the beautiful blue that you see sprinkled around here as well. So you'll notice that we do have a lot of footage from here, but that's because the site is absolutely vast. This entire palace complex comprises 7,700 rooms over 40 hectares and it includes 500 buildings. So when they say that this is the largest palace in Seoul and the whole of Korea then they're not kidding. The Queen at the time was really passionate about skating 
but they didn't quite have the technology here for it. However, this pond used to freeze. So then eventually she was actually able to hold a skating competition here, which kind of is a precursor to Korea's figure skating prowess that is now emerging because they are home to Olympic figure skating champion Yuna Kim. And then also there's a male figure skater here at the moment who's doing pretty well internationally called Jun Wa Cha and his Instagram handle is hilarious because it's June, July, August. The pavilion behind me was used for a lot of national banquets, but the interesting thing is about the design. So the pillars around the outside are square and the ones on the inside of it are circular. And there's a reason for it. It's because it was so said that the land or the ground is square and the sky is more rounded and circular. So that's why they wanted to use the juxtaposition between shapes. And then it's replicated on this island too, here in the middle of the pond, is the island is circular, but the pond itself is square. So that concludes the tour. Thank you so much. Thank really, really appreciate this. We have learned so much and we would never have known any of this if it weren't for you guys. Like we would have just walked around here appreciating how beautiful it was, but not knowing any of the stories. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Think of everything. <laughs>surrounded by all of these traditional houses. These traditional houses are called Hanoks, hence the name. And unlike other places whereby you'd have traditional houses but they're not currently in use, this is actually a residential area where each of these different Hanoks has been passed down over generations and generations. In this particular area, there are about three and a half thousand people who still live in here. As a result, you are allowed to go through as a tourist, but only during certain times of the day. And even then, you're asked to be quiet and respectful of the tourists, hence I'm talking to you in a bit more of a hushed voice.
for our final stop of the day, we turned up to Changyonggyung Palace and entry was just one Canadian dollar each. Amazing value. We're now standing in Changyonggyung Palace and it was built in the mid 15th century as one of the five royal palaces of the Junsun dynasty. Now, this palace shares a rear gardens with one of their other palaces called Chengjukgung. And I'm really, really sorry if I'm completely butchering the pronunciations. What we're about to walk into behind me here at this palace is actually the royal throne room here. And it is apparently of the five palaces, the oldest surviving royal throne room. And the reason they say that is because just like the palace we visited earlier today, this one has also been destroyed by the Japanese several times and keeps being rebuilt. to the palace that we were in earlier today then this is significantly smaller and far less opulent and there's definitely far fewer structures in the reason for that was for the purpose while the previous palace was the king's residence this one is more for the women in the court so we're talking the concubines the daughters and the ladies in waiting as well all the same though it is still a very nice place to be, it's still very serene and yeah, definitely still worth a visit. That brings us to the end of our adventuring for today. Mm -hmm. Where else can you spend eight Canadian dollars and get into two palaces? They're major tourist sites and one we got into for six Canadian dollars total and this one two Canadian dollars total. That is just value for money. It's pretty amazing and to be honest to get a real insight into what court life was like here and to just see like feudal Korean architecture and all of that kind of stuff it's just really beautiful and impressive in equal measure and so yeah this is a day very well spent. That plus also getting to try our first proper Korean meal in Korea. Uh, was equally a treat. So yeah, this is shaped up to be a really, really good day. I will say there are similarities between this style of palace and the one we've seen in India. Mm. It's not like what you would see in like England and France where it's one humongous building like Versailles or Windsor Castle. No. You know what I mean? Like in India and in here, there's layered courtyards and it always starts public and then gets more private. Then there's different residences for the king, his office, his concubines, mm -hmm. his wife, meeting halls for receiving dignitaries, and space for military parades. And so it's interesting to see how royal life differed between, I guess, the separation is more of Europe and Asia. It's just fascinating. I mean, we've only been here a couple of days and Korea has just made an instant impact on me. I absolutely love it here. And if anything, like if it were a little bit more cost effective to be here, then I would happily stay longer because uh, this is already a real gem of a place. Not that it's expensive, by the way, compared to Canada, mm -hmm. things are probably about half the price, I'd yeah. say. But it's just that when you're traveling for a whole year, South Korea compared to, let's say, Indonesia or Sri Lanka. And this is an expensive city, which yep. is why we're not going to be staying here for as long as we'd necessarily like. But I think we're just going to head back to our Airbnb and have a chill rest of the evening.
talk to some family maybe. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So with that, then there's not really much else to present to you for today. So we'll pick this up tomorrow with an all new set of things to check out. So until next time, take care. And keep smiling.